L. As of today, the most well-known references to the ancient supreme deity, the progenitor named El, are also preserved in mythology of the peoples that inhabited Syria, Palestine, and Phoenicia from the 4th to 3rd millennium BC. Different ancient peoples called El in different ways. For instance, one of the known names of God El is Il, Ilu, Ilum, Elim. In the Hellenistic period, El, Ilu, was identified with Zeus. In addition, he had different epithets by which he was revered by different peoples at other times. For example, in Syria and later on in the Roman Empire, he was revered as Elagabalus, meaning El of the mountain, Heliogabalus, the son of the mountains. Or, for instance, such epithets of El as El Olam, El Olam, meaning God the Everlasting One, El Elyon, meaning God Most High, are among the oldest names included in the Tanakh, the Bible of Judaism. It is interesting that the local god of Jerusalem, El Elyon, was revered as the highest god, the creator of heaven and earth, and the lord of the land, access to which was granted by him only on the condition of bringing tithes. El was, first and foremost, revered as a symbol of supreme power. He was considered the ruler of the world, the father of gods and people, sending down posterity to people, the king of the years, the lord of immortality. He was portrayed as a bearded old man in long clothes and a tall tiara with horns. El was depicted as accepting a sacrifice and blessing the sacrificer, and also in the image of a bull. Legends say that El lives near the source of the river, near the source of both oceans. He heads the council of all gods, his children. The gods act only with El's permission. The Ugarit list of gods mentions also El's father, whom El later on overthrows for the sake of his own power. But gradually, El himself loses this power too. In the first millennium BC, in the Judaic pre-Judaism pantheon, the image of El merges with the image of Yahweh, Yavu. He was widely revered in Phoenicia. In other tribes, Yahweh is revered as El's son. El's image as a symbol of power, the supreme deity who heads the council of gods, is preserved in the Bible. In the Old Testament, there are such words. God standeth in the assembly of gods. He judged among gods. In Hebrew, they sound like this. Mizmor le'asaf. Elohim nitzav bahadat el bekerev Elohim ishpot. Moreover, Elohim is one of the names of Yahweh in the Old Testament in the plural. That is, it means not God Yahweh, but God's Yahweh. In the beginning, God's created heaven and earth. In Hebrew, in place of the word God, there stands Elohim. The word Elohim is found almost 2,000 times in the Bible and originates from the pan-Semitic root El. El is also the ancient name of God in the Bible, of Judaism Tanakh. It's a collection of text included in the Christian Bible. In the Slavic Bible, it is traditionally translated by the word God in the meaning of being strong, powerful, at the top. Interesting Facts Fact 1 El is still regarded as a patron of not only the ancient cities, El can also be found in the names of geographical places, ancient architectural and temple buildings. El already appears not only in the designation of modern names, but also in the names of entire peoples, who don't even know about the true history. Why? It is exactly this way rather than otherwise that in the lobbies of kings and their rulers, an urgent decision is made about such renaming, and who sponsors such initiatives, and why. For example, let's take the history of ancient Greece. 
since the second millennium BC. Tribes of the Archaeans, the Archaeos, along with the Ionians, Dorians, and Aeolians. Aeolians were among the main ancient Greek tribes. However, in the seventh century BC, the Archons decided to give the common name Hellens to their subordinate tribes residing in the certain territories and Hellas to the country. That's how it is still called. Whereas for the people, the reason for the introduction of such names was suggested with a reference to myths that were also written by the Archons. But the question is whose history was written by the Archons themselves? Fact 2. Ibabara the White House. The White House is a well-known name, but why? Is the residence of rulers in different countries called precisely this way? Back in the third millennium BC, in ancient Mesopotamia, in the influential cities at that time, Sippar and Elisar, Larsa, there were two temples. The object of special concerns for Babylonian, Assyrian, and Chaldean kings. Thus, in both cities, these temples were called Ibabara, the White House, or the Brilliant House. For example, in Sippar, the White House consisted of 300 rooms and premises, among which there were dwellings of priests and royal chambers. White Houses were dedicated to the Akkadian god Shamash, who was the grandson of God Enlil. God Shamash was revered mainly as a god who established laws and watched their fulfillment. He was considered a bearer of light and prosperity, liberated prisoners, and even raised people from the dead. This god was portrayed as an old man with a long beard who was sitting on a throne. Aren't these images familiar to your consciousness? Fact 3. Selected by L. It is interesting that today, the word elite in different languages of the peoples of Europe has the same meaning, the selected one, and it is written almost identically. Elite. We are the elite. So I know not elite. Fear some of the global elite. Are elite. Free elite. elite. Your elite. elite. Controlled by the elite. elite. The elite of the elite in Mario Kart. Elite. The elite. We are elite. Maria elite Simone. Elite Simone. Elite. Elite Pro Elite. We're the elitist of the elite. Appa. Whoa, hey now. The term elite appeared since the 12th century in French and since the 14th century in English in the meaning to elect, to choose for service. That is, to select a servant to whom a subordinate group is assigned. In European languages, the word elite was widely spread by the end of the 19th century. It was brought into general use between the 1930s and 1940s. Today, it is said that the ideas that later on served as a basis for creation of the elite theory, namely, selection for the ruling circles, upbringing, and education of potential leaders, among others were developed by the descendant of the Archon Solon, the ancient Hellenic philosopher, Plato. That very Plato, who exactly mentioned the ancient legend of the Atlantis. But what was his ideology and the ideology of those whose will he implemented in his works based on. Old New Ideology The Iliad The Odyssey The Iliad The Odyssey are ancient Greek epic poems attributed to the unknown poet named Homer. Until now, these works are extolled for new generations as unsurpassed literary masterpieces, monuments of world significance. But what is their essence? 
Homeric epics, the Iliad and the Odyssey, have similarities with the Babylonian epic Enuma Elish, as well as with He Who Saw Everything about the hero Gilgamesh and other legends of the Sumerian and Babylonian literature. The names of the main gods have been changed, but the key note concealed in these stories about the epic of the Trojan War and the wanderings of the leading characters comes down to one thing. The last word in the fate of the hero or people rests with the Council of Gods, headed by the main human-like god, to whom all human qualities and vices are characteristic. In fact, it is not just a monument of the past, it is an inculcation in the human consciousness of the Atlantean ideology, the history of the life of gods sitting on the mountain of immortality, Olympus. The Iliad tells about the participants of the Trojan War. The key moment is that all the gods of Olympus participated in it. Moreover, not the gods themselves participated, but they gathered a council and decided, headed by Zeus, how the course of events will exactly evolve, who is destined to lose and perish, even if luck was on the side of certain heroes or peoples. Generally speaking, it was like playing chess with oneself. That is, the game of gods was shown while the listener's consciousness was immersed in emotions of the fights and strife of the heroes, their conflict relations. Speaking in modern terminology, this is a thriller that ends tragically for the characters, where the leading hero, whose example in theory should be followed by people, Heracles, commits suicide. And again, the idea is asserted that immortality is the destiny of gods, but not of people. The Odyssey also tells about the wanderings of the main hero, Odysseus, who miraculously survived the Trojan War, about his meeting with various peoples, monsters, with phenomena of the invisible world and magic. However, the keynote of the work remains the same. The gods gathered a council and decided on the fate of Odysseus, and then ruled the hero in his wanderings as a puppet. As a result, with the hero's hands, the undesired ones were destroyed, the obedient ones were rewarded, and the last word rest with gods. Just like in the case of the Sumerians, the text was intended for easy memorization and perception by primary consciousness. That is, for the level of perception of a six-year-old child. Heroes or actions were associated with the moments encountered by a person in everyday life, and this served as an additional reminder of the plot. Just like in the case of the Sumerians, these works were addressed specifically to listeners, not to thinking readers, with the purpose of provoking collective emotions. It was assumed that the listener knew the backstory, so the emphasis was made precisely on affecting the listener emotionally. Moreover, as an introduction to such declamations were used the Homeric hymns containing appeals to different gods. Poems were created by the same technique as the Sumerians had. During a quick emotional recitation, like through music perception, the public's attention is focused on the plot and its development. Such a peculiar ancient rap rock concert. The result is a state of collective excitation of the animal nature in the public. Simply put, a collective aggregore was generated. People were emotionally infected with the thoughts about the plot, and they themselves became active bearers and distributors of the history about the gods of Olympus among common people. Just like in the case of the Sumerians, when they were preparing their ancient journalists, special people were also being prepared here for promotion. As it has already been mentioned, since the 6th century BC, there were people who at the legislative level had the right to publicly recite Homer's poems, the so-called Sons of Homer, Rhapsodes. But who gave birth to the image of Homer himself, so to say? Whose son was Homer? What a Homer. Why, exactly Homer? Several interesting facts have been preserved in the history. Fact one. In the first millennium BC, especially between the 10th and 7th centuries BC, events took place that subsequently influenced the change of the worldview of not only peoples of the East, but also of the West, 
and reflected on the worldview of modern people. Precisely in those times, the Babylonian epic poem, Anuma Elish, was popular and continued to be translated into different languages. The ancient Hebrew Bible, Tanakh, appeared which later on formed the basis of the Bible's Old Testament. The epic poem of Homer the Iliad and the Odyssey was being composed. It is interesting that God Enlil was known to the ancient Hellenas owing to the Babylonian translations under the name of Ilinos and the word Eliada. The Jewish Eliada is translated from Hebrew as whom God El knows or El knew, recognized. Enlilship, Enlil, Ilinos, Eliada, the Iliad. Fact two, in the Bible, Precisely in the Old Testament, there is a mention of the descendants of Noah, the man who survived the flood according to ancient oriental stories. Noah had three sons. The eldest of them was named Jepheth. Jepheth had seven sons. One of them was Homer, and the other was Javan, while one of the sons of Javan was Elysius, Jewish Elisha. It is they who are considered to be the ancestors of the Hellenists, the ancient Greeks. Fact 3. According to Greek legends, it is precisely Helene, the grandson of Prometheus, and another version, the son of Zeus, who is the progenitor of all Hellenists, while his sons and grandsons are the eponyms of the main Greek tribes. Why exactly Mount Olympus? The name of Olympus is of pre-Greek origin. In the legend, Mount Olympus was considered to be sacred and became the abode of the Hellenic gods and the center of mythological stories. Few people know that Mount Olympus got its name from the word El, Alam. In fact, it's an expression known since ancient times, meaning the same as the Sumerian, the immortal El's mountain. Until now, in scientific studies of literature of the past, there is the so-called Homeric question. The learned men still argue when, where, by whom, and for whom were these poems composed. Consciousness, as always, draws attention away from the main question to trifles. That is, not global causes of origin, spreading around the world and the effects of these works on the minds of entire epochs and generations are highlighted. But the dispute boils down to the point who wrote them one person or a collective of co-authors. And this dispute is traditional, but not focused on the essence. Organized criticism began from the 6th century BC as another way of promotion and drawing attention to the works. Later on, it was organized by means of such authorities as the same Plato who criticized Homer. He, so to speak, led those who were against in order to manipulate their opinion in the right direction. And Aristotle, who praised Homer's works, and accordingly, led those who supported. Basically, like in the game of adults, good cop, bad cop. Which is fine, except for the fact that it was the same team. Plato was Aristotle's teacher, the team that fulfilled the wishes of sponsors, who pursued the goal of seizing power and restoring their former world domination. And those who knew how human consciousness worked and how to activate it. It was not by chance that Aristotle became the teacher of the 13-year-old Alexander the Great, a future creator of the world power, who was inculcated with a new worldview through love for the Homer's Iliad, and to such an extent that subsequently this conqueror of nations will keep this version of the Iliad compiled by Aristotle under his pillow along with his dagger. It is known that Alexander the Great always carried a volume of the Iliad with him in a golden box. As it is written in the Game of Gods by the plot of the Iliad, the gods quickly create a hero, use him, and then he dies by the gods' will and his name is used in subsequent propaganda. Nowadays, everyone knows the name of Alexander the Great, but who feels better because of that? The military campaigns of Alexander the Great contributed to dissemination of the Hellenism foundations to the East, 
and this trend was also popularized among peoples. In the Middle Ages, one of the most popular books in several regions of Asia and Africa, as well as in Europe, was The Romance of Alexander, where the biography of the leading character was reinforced with fictional episodes. In the era of Barak, Alexander the Great became a popular character in theater and painting. The spreading of the Archon's worldview is still going on by all means that are available for them. But what is its nature from within? <laughs>